I'm here with Bob from Semi, and today we're talking all about knowledge graphs. Bob, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. First things first, what is a knowledge graph? So a knowledge graph uh, tries to store real-world entities in a data object. And what we try to do with knowledge graphs is to actually try to understand how the real world works and drive knowledge rather than just data from um, uh, the way that we store the information. Right, now that's different from a traditional database, which just stores information. Yes, so for example, let's say that you would store information about a movie. Then um, there's all these relations that you might have in your head about the movie, maybe actors or locations or things that come to mind. But if you store that in a traditional database, a lot of context just gets lost. It's just a database, uh, you could argue that a database is just dumb. It's a, it's a dumb way of storing information. What you try to do with a knowledge graph is to actually uh, keep that information and keep that context so that you get a 360 degree overview of what you're actually storing and that people can query um, uh, for the knowledge rather than the raw data or information. So it sounds a lot like a traditional graph database, but you're also adding in this knowledge or learning aspect. Yes, that's a good point. So the graph part is, one could argue that everything that we store um, has a relation to something else. Um, um, so for example, and back to the movies, if you would look at, at a movie, a movie has certain actors, in, and they're born somewhere, and well, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, there's always a relation, so that's, that's the graph part. What the knowledge part adds on top of that is like, can we actually try to derive knowledge from that information? Um, so let's say that you would have an actor who is born in Paris, uh, but you know, query for which actors come from France, that it actually understand, oh wait, now I need to show this actor who was born in Paris, because there's a relation between Paris and France. So WeV8 is the product that you've built that yes. is a knowledge graph. What makes WeV8 special among knowledge graphs? Yeah, so I would argue that there are, uh, there are three things there. So the first thing is, is that we don't store data objects in a, in a traditional way, so in a, in a table or in a traditional graph. We store it in a space. And this is a semantic space, so every time when you add a new data object, we try to determine what does this that object mean? What does it represent in the real world? And we place that in a space. So for example, with the actor example, if you would have an actor uh, who is born in Paris, then it would be closely related to France. So that's how we store, that's one. Um, the second thing that we do is that we're completely API based. And um, that is also where we, where we stop, if you will. So we try to enable others to build these semantic systems. Uh, and thirdly, that is something that we learned through the semantic aspect, is that we can now also do automatic classification, which basically means that, to stay in the, with the example of, uh, of uh, France, that if you would have a country with the name France and a city with the name Paris, the knowledge graph can actually automatically drive, hey, wait a second, uh, Paris is the capital of France. Right, so that learning aspect comes back in. How does it actually do the learning? I mean, you're inserting the data by using data objects, but then it's got to figure out how these are related. Yeah, that's a great question, actually. So um, the interesting thing is like, how do we define learning? So we have the, the data science aspect of learning, but we also have the, the engineering aspect of learning. And one of the problems that we wanted to solve is that every time when you add a new data object, we didn't want to retrain the machine learning model because you know, it now takes about 48 hours to train, so just imagine if you want to add a thousand data objects, that's, well, that's undoable. So, what we learned was that the uh, machine learning model that we use has all these vector positions. So those are representations of concepts in that space. And what we do is that the moment that you add data, we try to algorithmically uh, determine where to place it in this space. So our learning, if you will, is not necessarily retraining, it's just trying to understand where do we need to place this data object in the space, which makes it very fast from an engineering perspective, which results in a better UX. So a, a user doesn't really notice that uh, they are working with a, a database, uh, or sorry, data solution that um, incorporates both a machine learning model and a, and a storage mechanism. Yeah, so how does it actually do, I mean, you, you have the data, you're able to add it in, it figures out the new things, but without retraining, it seems very hard that it would be able to learn these new properties. Yeah, so there, uh, there are three ways how we can do that. So we have the out-of-the-box knowledge, which we like to call the common knowledge. So we train that on open data sets. Um, so in English, for example, think about Wikipedia, the dictionary, but also scientific articles, etc. So that's what we like to call the common knowledge. 
Um, now you can do two things. So there might be a situation where you have a very specific domain knowledge um, that you want to add. So think about uh, use cases in, in, in banking, the oil and gas industry, healthcare, etc. So what you can do uh, through the RESTful API, you can literally add it in natural language. So you can say, I'm going to now teach you a concept. These are the words of the concept. And this is the description in common knowledge. Because if you think how uh, you and I learn new words, that's how we do it. We, or to, to children, we explain in common language um, uh, new concepts. So what happens under the hood is that we take that concept and the description, we calculate a new position in that vector space, and that's where that new concept lives. So if you now start to add data objects that talk about that concept, that's how we give it its semantic understanding. So you're able to kind of teach it the new concepts, and then it makes those new associations without having to do this new layer of retraining, basically. Exactly, because we wanted to have this, um, this, this UX aspect is number one for us, and then speed plays a role. So how fast can we do this? And that's the beautiful thing, again, of that vectorization of concepts and words. Uh, because we can calculate with it, which means it's fast. So what's the case where a knowledge graph might not be a good solution? Yeah, so for example, if you have a lot of streaming data or if you have a lot of logs, for example, that you need to search through fast, um, what we see in practice is that often you have a traditional database and a, and a knowledge graph and they, they live you know, um, uh, together and you solve problems together. So, or for example, transactions at a bank, then you, you, know, you want to store them in a tra transactional fashion. But if you don't want to search through them or find specific things, then that's where the knowledge graph comes in and takes that information and stores it in a different way. Right, so this isn't supposed to replace databases out there as a whole, but it's a new layer of looking at your data. Yes, that's indeed what I would argue. It's just a completely different way of um, uh, looking at data. However, I would like to say, though, if people would like to change their data infrastructure with VV8, I'm all for it. <laughs> Well, it's really exciting to hear about the space, so thank you very much for coming in, Bob. Thank you.